Well, hello, and welcome to the Bomb City Podcast. My name is Nick, and this is episode 16, my interview with Freddie Corbin from Temple Tattoo and Tattoo 13 in Oakland, California. Now, Freddie's been tattooing in the Bay Area for over 30 years. In fact, the day we recorded this interview was the 19th anniversary of Temple Tattoo being open in downtown. Uh, I had a great time recording this interview. We talk about a lot of really important stuff, uh, tattooing, tradition, the, the culture of tattooing in the Bay Area. It really meant a lot to be able to talk about these things with someone who I respect so much. So thank you very much to Freddie and to, uh, to Everett at Temple for being such awesome hosts while, we, while I was down there. So here it is. Uh, I'll let the interview stand for itself. Uh, episode 16, my interview with Freddie Corbin. Thank you so much for listening. You want me to introduce myself? or the, yeah, That's probably a good place to start. Okay. My name is uh, Freddie Corbin, and I live in Oakland, California, and I own Temple Tattoo and Tattoo 13. Right on. So... We were talking about uh, how you got into tattoos a little earlier. Uh, do you want to tell me how you got started with um, getting into the, the in industry? Yeah, I mean, briefly, in a nutshell, I just, you know, did what everybody else did. I just loved tattooing, and I wanted to tattoo, so I continued to get tattooed by people. And the people that were more willing to give out information, I got closer to, you know, so got tattooed by a few people and then I met a guy or his body and he was open to stuff so I started hanging out with him and I started getting tattooed by Henry and yeah. getting tattooed by Chuck Eldridge and Bill Salmon and every Ed Hardy eventually and everybody else that was around you know because yeah. I just wanted to be a part of that community like the whole San Francisco tattoo yeah world. yeah like the latter 80s you know what I mean like I moved there in 86 so it's like 87 right I was one but <laughs> I know it's trippy it, it's yeah. trippy I'll tattoo people that were like born after I started tattooing or like grown ass adults yeah. <laughs> not like teenagers <laughs> the shop has been open enough now it's 19 years today so there's been a few like infant gets tattooed there later or like you know somebody brings in their little five year old sister you know their, or, the, or maybe it's their niece yeah. you know like one of my buddies, oh, it's my niece, she's four or five, and you know, now she's like 27, and has been getting tattooed there for years, so it's been that way a couple times. I was reading your first tattoo was at Lyle Pebble Shop in San Francisco. Yes, sir. Yeah. My first tattoo, I did myself with a needle and thread, so, yeah, and my, set, my first proper tattoo was at Lyle's. Right. Yeah, my real first real tattoo was at Lyle's. That's cool. That's such a, a huge shop. Um, was Lyle around when you were getting tattooed? Was he still like... You know, he was, he was around, but he wasn't like around when I got tattooed the first couple times. He had he had already like in the late 70s, early 80s opened up like that Rose Cafe where the shop is now up on Columbus and was living up in Ukiah and coming down. And So I met him, I think, when Terry Ridley was like working at Lyle's and they had like a little party at the tattoo museum, you know, and... Uh, I think I won a sheet of flash from Terry Wrigley. They had a little raffle and stuff. It was pretty cool, yeah. And that was that was in like eighty seven, into eighty seven or something like that. So yeah, so Lyle was around but he wasn't really tattooing. I never tried to get tattooed by Lyle until it was nineteen ninety. Yeah. And he wasn't tattooing then. He answered the phone but he wasn't tattooing. And it took I actually got tattooed by him about four years ago. Wow. Well. Yeah. Got a signature. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, he's been doing just signatures for a long time now, right? Yeah, well, I think he quit for a minute, you know, because in 90, we were like, where did we get the signature? A star, anything, yeah. you know? Me and uh, Dan Higgs were, were trying to get tattooed on, like, New Year's Day, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> so I'm surprised they even picked up the phone, but, but he, you know, he something about, like, his back or something, you know? He has yeah. some, like, great line about why he wasn't tattooing. <laughs> it's an awesome place to, to cut your teeth and tattooing. Oh, it was beautiful. Did you end up working at that shop, or was that just where you were hanging out and uh, sort of learning? And no, no, no. I was hanging out at Erno's, and I was learning how to tattoo at Erno's right. with uh, Greg Coles and Dan Higgs, and some cuffs was hanging around, and Sailor Cam rolled through there, and uh, it was a bit of a free for all. And I was hanging out at, at Henry Goldfield's a lot. Yeah. Like that's that's probably where I was like learning more stuff about tattooing was at Henry's. That's I was awesome. working at Erno's. Yeah. That's such a such a cool shop. I spent a lot of time there too. It's a oh man, yeah, such a special place. Very special. Yeah, an amazing carpet. Yeah, the carpet is amazing. Did you, did you ever tell you the story about the carpet? <laughs> Something about like was it upholstery store? It was a, it was like a couple of guys rolled it up from a movie theater because it, it had oh, that look. Oh yeah, right? yeah. And when they yeah. unrolled it the first time, it still had popcorn in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember he did tell me it came from a movie theater. It's pretty great. I think uh, Bob 
James got a big square out of that when they were leaving. Like someone kept a big oh, piece rad. of the carpet. What a great thing to keep. I yeah. wish I would have thought of that. I mean, right. there were still people. I went by there that time, but there were still a lot of people hanging out. But yeah. I, would, I wish I wish I had a little. I'd make it into some kind of like tattoo tapestry or something like that. Right. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy that there's another shop tattooing in there now. That's yeah. Bizarre to think about. Yeah. I mean, there's people tattooing Lyles right now, which is kind of wild too. You know. Which is cool. Yeah. You know, it's a cool space. It's been there forever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people tattooing. Yeah, and it's it's hard to hold it against someone being new or like starting something. Like, oh, you mean as far as like somebody just coming in and renting it? Yeah, I mean, it, like it's it's cool. There's a little like funny twinge to it not being the, the same as it was, but uh, yeah. Well, there's like I guess it depends on what kind of circumstances it happens under. Because if it's under good circumstances, then it's rad, you know. If it's somebody who like respected Henry and wants to like you know keep the torch of flame as yeah. they say then you know then it's then it's kind of cool that somebody's in there working that mojo you know but then there's other situations like my friend uh howie saunders who died in a motorcycle accident he had roomy tattoo in philly or like you know eric mosky thank god 10 hundreds bought that place but the parents parents try and run them for a while and they don't know what's going on and then some other person comes through and buys it and Rumi had like all kinds of beautiful you know uh, murals on the walls and it would have mosaics and everything and somebody blasted over it with black paint you know <laughs> just it's a totally dated like modern primitive thing that was just <laughs> disgustingly <laughs> ugly yeah so eventually you ended up working at, at Hardy Shop too right yeah and you know what I don't want to talk about that for very long because I was at Vice they redid that Vice thing like five years later and it's super cool that they did it but I think people know the story of like where I learned how to tattoo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I kind of even thought to myself, I'd rather just talk about Temple and like from the time I got to Oakland forward instead of continuing to talk about San Francisco. Sure, yeah. I, you know what I mean? So let's just move on. Yeah, yeah I got no problem with that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, how do yeah you I worked for Ed for like five years. It was amazing. You know, it's totally killer. with Betty Deutsch and Igor and Dan. And, and even the name Temple came out of that, that time, right? Yeah, it did. It did. We were going to call it Temple, and uh, but we were thinking of different names, and and then we had realized that Tattoo City had burned down 13 years earlier. So yeah. the fact that it was like 13 years, and then Tattoo City is such a you know wicked yeah. name that it was, you know, it was like oh man, we could like reopen Tattoo City in North Beach. So that was like obviously a better idea, and then it worked out for me because I got to keep it for my shop. I imagine it's a lot different tattooing in San Francisco versus in downtown Oakland. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, completely, completely. Jumping from, like, North Beach, which is, like, lots of money and lots of tourists, and, you know, to downtown Oakland, which, it, you know, was cool, but it kind of suffered, like, a post-earthquake depression down here, you know, where yeah. a lot of buildings were, like, being rebuilt, but there was no, like, money or not a lot of businesses down here. It was mostly just, like, maybe barber shops and donut shops, you know. And parking lots, you know, people that work downtown. A couple like sandwich spots, that was about it. You know. But um I've always loved it. You know, it was a nice change. I could tell you a couple things that are different. It's like yeah. uh you know, it was really cool because I had learned from tattooing in like Des Moines, Iowa and you know, San Diego or other places around, even Sacramento, that that like um, I liked working in Lower income area, low income areas, because, or I should say, like working class yeah. areas. It's a better word. Um, working class to low income because I liked the tattoos that people were getting, and uh, it was like kind of easy. It wasn't like appointments and being booked up, you know, or like yeah. going home and drawing because you knew what you had to do tomorrow, and that's all good and, and important and stuff like that. But uh, you know, it was nice to have like a little break after tattooing for like 12 or 13 years and just get to do like pit bulls and old English and lettering and names and roses and I love doing that stuff so I got to do that shit over and over and over again lots of grim reapers and pit bulls and stuff like that and words you know so that was cool it was fun and then it changed a little bit when Scott and Colin came in of course you know things kind of shifted more people started working there and more people started like paying attention to it and stuff yeah you know, and then it kind of went more into like that older way I had tattooed before. You know. Yeah, I 
I guess the big thing I wanted to talk about was the, the tattoo school and sort of, I read you said something about like the, the code of ethics that you hold with Temple Tattoo and like, can you explain what that what that means? Like like what the, the code of I ethics mean, you guys hold as a tattoo shop is? Well, I mean, I wouldn't be one to presume that like I know what the code of ethics is and I don't even know if there is a code of ethics. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I just, uh, and I can say that there's not in a lot of cases, you know what I mean? And there is, you know, like, uh, for example, there's people that just hold it really dear to their hearts, and then there's things that would feel right or wrong in their heart to do or not to do, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, and uh, we're all trying to make a living, you know what I mean? And, like, nobody's got retirement from tattooing, so if somebody comes up with a patent or, you know, you know, people jump in in Las Vegas and open up shops and casinos. You know, there's nothing you can really do to stop that wave. Yeah. You can just kind of like, you know, it depends what kind of person you are, I guess, too. You know, like, if you don't believe in karma or something, then I guess it's kind of like no holds barred. Just do whatever the fuck you can get away with, you know? <laughs> but if you're somebody that does or you truly love it and it's something dear to you and you've worked really hard for it, maybe it was hard to get to or a long ride then you might take a little, you know, you might be a little angry or get a little pissed off or have a little judgment against somebody that comes in and does something like the tattoo school, which, you know, doesn't really have a lot of integrity involved with it. It's really just a business to make money. And I know that there's also, you know, if we're going to talk about this, I know there's other people that do the same kind of thing. And it's like the shows, for example, yeah. TV shows. You know, I've had really good friends on those shows, and I've even gone on those shows. Would I want it to change the dynamic of where I work on a daily basis? No. Right. You know, would I want to be able to, like, just go to dinner with my friends and talk and not have, like, five or six people stop me and be like, hey, I saw you on that show, you know what I mean? I've seen my friends go through that, and that's got to be kind of difficult, you know? Right. And some of them deal with it really well, and some of them deal with it differently. But, uh... I guess it just depends on like where your heart is you know like when I went on Ink Master you know I just like I was asked to do it and you know I, I got a kid and a wife at the house and I was going to be able to like split and go to New York for the weekend and, and I got paid and I got to see my friends and hang out and it was totally cool I jumped on it you know it felt it felt okay to me you know yeah um you know, I've done some stuff for Sons of Anarchy, you know, I've done, a, I've tried to get paid for drawings, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with, like, making money on art, you know, um, it's what I do for a living, you know, but the thing is about this tattoo shop, or excuse me, this tattoo school that was opening out of existing tattoo shop that was here, kind of in our neighborhood up the street, was that, I mean, it was like three blocks from where I live, yeah. you know, it's like five blocks from where Tattoo 13 is, it's kind of in our neighborhood, and and fortunately, Oakland isn't like that big where we don't really kind of know each other, you know? Yeah. And even if we don't know each other, we know where that person is and maybe who works there, depending on how long they've been there or whatever. So it just felt like in my gut, like, you know, I'm already kind of what I went through is like, I'm already watching and listening to people that have been tattooing in the area for a long time that are struggling and talking about how it's harder to make rent, there's a lot more tattooers, you know, the pie's getting sliced thinner and thinner, and that's life, and we can all adjust and get smaller places to live in and do stuff like that to make it work. But this is something that was really going to totally affect, like, all of our livelihoods, you know? Um, so... It was like, this just doesn't feel right, you know? And um, what, what was the big change that you felt that it was that it was bringing to tattooing? Well, I could tell you exactly what my guess would be and what I know happens is they let whoever can pay to come in and start learning. And you don't have to, like, sign up to, to actually, like, you know, do two years. They'll take payments and teach you a couple months at a time. Wow. You know what I mean? So... You could just jump in and get a few thousand bucks or six thousand or whatever the hell they're charging. You can look on their website and find out. But um, you know, what was going to happen was is it was going to not only you know I, there's a lot of details we could get into later. Like there is a placement system and the formula of how they make it all work and all that stuff. What it would have done 
is it would have been like floodgates of amateur tattooers entering the area. I have friends that live in New Jersey and Philadelphia that live near, have shops where these schools have opened. Mm -hmm. And what happens is these people come in and they learn how to tattoo for, you know, six to 18 months or whatever it is. And then they go looking for a job and nobody gets hired because they're not good yet. Right. And it's like, you know, you don't, what a lot of people I think don't understand is you would never, I would never teach somebody I don't know how to tattoo, right? Like somebody comes in and they're like, hey, I want to get an apprenticeship. Yeah. It's like, cool, good for you. you know? <laughs> and then it's like, well, would you apprentice me? It's like, I don't even fucking know you. I've been sitting here having a cigarette with you for 10 minutes. Yeah. I don't know what you're about. You know, it's like, I would never even expect that. If somebody was going to apprentice someone, I would assume they would at least know each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a big commitment. So either, you know, you're friends with that person and you see something in them, or I've had friends start tattooing that, you know, never even drew before. They were just around the tattoo scene and it blew up in the 90s and they jumped on the bandwagon. And you know what? Good for them because they were just like, whatever, I see Joe Blow doing this and they don't even give a shit. I'm at least covered in tattoos and love tattooing and actually work in a tattoo shop, you know? Yeah. So it's like anything. You know, like the guy, the kid that hangs out at the mechanics down the street from where he works, grew up, or, you know, Bob Shaw, who hung out at the tattoo shop next to where he grew up, you know, you get to know somebody and get to like them and they're like, become one of the family, or you want to pass it off to somebody and maybe you meet somebody or somebody's getting tattooed by you that wants to learn how to tattoo. I mean, that's probably how it goes for most folks, yeah. you know? Yeah. So... You know, in essence, for a fee, they would say, you know, we hold the almighty certificate that says that you're a tattooer, right? And they're not the only ones that do this, right? And I've even known of tattoo shops, you know, not that it's like my place to, I'm not going to name names, but I know tattoo shops that will just knock out apprentices so they got somebody free answering the phone, like every you know, year they got a new person and that person always bails in like two years. I know a couple of them, you know, a couple of them are good people and they started at this place and they pretty much went there and answered the phone and they knew they were going to even leave in a year because they knew it wasn't a place that they'd even want to learn how to tattoo, but like anything anybody can do to get their foot in the door is what's going to happen, you know? Yeah. So, um, so for a fee, these people were letting, willing to let anyone put their foot in the door in our neighborhood. And, you know, if somebody wants to move to Oakland and tattoo here, it's a free country. And no tattooer is going to roll up to them and be like, hey, dude, you can't do that. This yeah. is our town. You know what I mean? Like, that's super old school, like the old way. And, you know, we've all kind of, like, worked hard in the 80s and the 90s and, you know, the new millennia to, like, you know, prove to the world that we're good people too and yeah. blah 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 you know doctors get tattooed and lawyers get tattooed and we're not the scum of the earth and now it's like a complete 180 and everything has been like kind of commercialized and sold to us you know yeah. from either tattooing or outlaw bikers or rock and roll or whatever it is to now we like want to be back in that like primordial <laughs> soup of scumbags yeah. where like nobody wanted to be a part of it because yeah. it was actually a lot more fun and lucrative yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, that's what we get for promoting it, you know, yeah. and uh, and we turn the Ed Hardy and everybody behind him like tried to turn the world on, maybe unintentionally turn the world on to like what tattooing is, and yeah. it's a beautiful thing, you know, just like music. So, like the punk rock wave, you know what I mean? It's like you know who's going to tell somebody they shouldn't play music, you know? Right. But um, you know, so basically. This place was opening up in our neighborhood, and we knew that they were just going to, like, you know, pump tattooers out from the experiences I mentioned earlier, from friends in Jersey and Philly, seeing the rift. Those people go and open up tattoo shops because they don't get hired. Right. Half of them are a little financially privileged, hence being able to take the classes in the first place. Right. You know, like, hey, I don't have to really work, or I can work a part-time job and take these classes. Like, going to school, you know, yep. make it happen. And then they jump out, they don't get hired, so then they open up another tattoo shop. And it is a free country, but it's like, I kind of, when I heard that they were open, because I got 
pulled into a thread with uh, six other tattooers, and one of those six tattooers had gotten the same letter that the fellow that sold the tattoo shop, which is called Premium Tattoo, to uh, ART, something responsible tattooing. I don't even know what it stands for, you know, but the fuckers that were like going to open up the <laughs> tattoo school down the street, it was just something visceral. You know what I mean? It was just like, no, 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 no. Like, this, this can't happen. Like, fuck, man, we made it through last year. Yeah. This year's a fucking bitch already. And then this is going to happen, you know? So uh, so that's how that all started. Yeah. You know, I got pulled into a thread with, like, six tattooers. Yeah, it, it's interesting to, to hear a little more about it. Because I don't know that the, uh, like, what you were saying, where it's not just a bunch of guys getting together saying, no, you can't join our, our neighborhood or get in on our block. It's, it's not like that at all. Really, it's it's about intent and uh, definitely, and that's sort of that's sort of woven through everything we've talked about. Like, I mean, have you read the uh, the book that Ed Hardy published, the Sailor Jerry Collins book, their letters together? I've read some of them. I haven't read it from from front to back. I was I was looking for it before I headed over. I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's been a few years, but I remember really uh, vividly. Sailor Jerry hated the idea of Lionel Tuttle doing tattoo classes. And they oh, were yeah. the big, big uh, rift between them because of that. Oh yeah. And Lyle, I mean Lyle Tuttle went on like Johnny Carson. He was one of the first big tattoo celebrities. Right? Totally, totally. And so, but to me, I, that's that's ancient history by the time yeah. I was even born. So, yeah. to me, all I see is intent. And, and Lyle Tuttle seems to have maintained being a really genuine and cool guy that you can respect. So for like sure, sure. I for see, me, in yeah, retrospect, yeah. Like, it sort of looks like a similar controversy. Like the difference is we're in a different time. Yeah. And you can reach way more people these days because we have the internet and things like that. So uh, I could understand Jerry's opinion of Lyle because yeah. it's like, man, you know what? That motherfucker's making enough money already. You know what I mean? Why does he need to like charge people to teach him how to tattoo? Like if they're meant to be in it, they'll be in it. You yeah. know. And you know, I can even see what Lyle was doing. I'm not saying that I agree with it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even, like, that was before I started tattooing. And I totally admire Lyle. Yeah. You know, Lyle, to me, is a gangster. And he's done, you know, a lot of things. He's been a pioneer of this trade. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pass any judgment yeah. on Lyle. So, so I admire him. And I think he's kind of a badass. He's a bit of a cowboy. He's kind of like yeah. the, the Clint Eastwood of tattooing. It's not that everything that he's done is right. He just can do it because he's Lyle. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, so that's that, you know. And that has, like, I can see your comparison. But to me, at this point, and where I'm at now in it, you know, I have 30 years in the business now and, um, you know, whatever that means. But it was just nothing alike. Because yeah. Zeke Owens, not Zeke Owens, excuse me. Uh, what was the old Spalding and Rogers right put out a book wasn't it who Jonah who did that book that learn how to tattoo book it was was it Huck Spalding is he here oh, I don't know oh he must have what <laughs> anyway I can't remember I think yeah. it was probably a, like it wasn't it was pre Spalding and Rogers but I think it might have been Huck Spalding I can't remember you know it's like a book from the 50s that yeah. like you know so you could buy the package and you buy the tattoo there's always been people selling tattoos yeah. And there's always been people that are like, hey, don't do that. And then there's been people that are like, hey, what does it matter? You know yeah. what I mean? And that's that's kind of like maybe a part of the recipe of like the conversation that we're having about the tattoo school. But when we come down to it, you know, like anything that I can do in my career that I don't feel isn't wrong, I would do because I have a kid and, you know, business and I have to pay rent and there's sure. a lot of fucking bills and you know what I mean? But let's use the school, for example. If if somebody said to me, like, hey, uh, you know, I'll give you a million bucks and we're going to open up, like, the Temple Tattoo tattoo School, yeah. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Because I would be, like, taking a million bucks to, like, lose the respect of all these people that I really care about, you know, and, like, fall out of the family of people, like, the tattoo family that I have and, and friends, you know. Um if somebody said to me, like, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to do a show where, you know, we'll take you to India and you could 
tattoo like all those dudes in Aussie got that you tattoo for free. You could do that, and then we'll fly you over to Iraq, and you could tattoo some vets yeah. or, or some soldiers. Yeah. I'd do that in a fucking second. You know what I mean? Because it would be like, well, that sounds like a fucking blast. Because it, cause it's true to who you are. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with making money. I mean, that, no. that's, that's the reality of, of there's life. No, there's nothing wrong and with making money. I had, a, I had a meeting with the owner of the tattoo school um, the day after I kind of put him on blast. Like, yeah. I, the, and, and basically, I'll tell you about the meeting first. But, um, you know, we had a very civil conversation. Yeah. You know, I could say he was a nice guy. You know, I remembered meeting him once when he got tattooed by Eddie George back in the day in Texas City. I was there that day. We had a fun day. You know, I knew him for, you know, eight hours. Yeah. And uh, he seemed like a really cool dude. And, uh, you know, his tattoos don't look that great. And he opened up this school. And he's actually smart for that. I mean, if you're thinking about business, that's a market sure. that is easily filled. Yeah. It's just none of us have done it because we know it's like quote unquote unethical. Right. You know what I mean? So so that's why we haven't done it. You know, it's not like we haven't thought of it. You know what I mean? It's and then when the shows happen and stuff, you know, you get pitched and you know, some people where it's like National Geographic and my friend Permanent Mark like went to Bangkok and yeah. and uh, Japan and, and some other third place I can't remember right now. But uh, well Borneo. Right. You know, like went out into the Borneo jungle. You know, and that was awesome. You yeah. know, it was one of the best shows on tattooing I've ever seen, you know. But uh I guess it's like you said, it's like what's true to you and, you know, if you're somebody that has more of a, you know, I don't want to say gypsy, but more of a kind of like, let's say, you know, snake oil salesman kind of approach, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're just kind of cruising through town and doing your thing and you're a little bit of a, sh got a little side of shyster side to you, then, then maybe you would find that to be okay. Yeah. You know, but I just could never, I couldn't do something like that, for example. Do you think being around people like like Ed Hardy or, or Lyle Tuttle did that give you a different perspective on on what it looks like to be like a a big but respectable tattooer versus like a, a TV celebrity? Like to, to actually know who who Ed Hardy is if we saw his, like his name being synonymous with like douchebag at a poker table or you right. know like whatever. The it's interesting you say poker table. Yeah, it's interesting because I have a friend who plays uh plays cards for a living. Like he's really good. At yeah. This. I like that too at playing poker. And he told me that that uh, when people wear Ed Hardy clothing, they kind of descend onto them. <laughs> and what's hilarious is that sh like poker sharks will flip that yeah. and show up in like full Ed Hardy clothing to look like they're a mark, <laughs> and then kind of flip it, yeah. you know, and take them in like one hand. How hilarious is that, right? Um, so, anyways, yes, that does change your perspective. You know what? When it comes to the Ed Hardy clothing stuff, you know, Ed is like the Don of tattooing. Yeah. Hence going by Don Ed Hardy, right? So he knows that. He knows he's the Don. And he's done a lot of incredible stuff. And I'm really super glad he's successful, you know? You know, do I like the way the clothes look? No. I've seen a couple pairs of tennis shoes and stuff that look kind of cool, yeah. like Sailor Jerry's shit <laughs> drawn on them, and they look like Converse, and... You know, you go, oh, those are cool, I'd wear those, you know, or whatever. Um, so I don't have, like, a bunch of negative judgment towards Jerry or Lyle or Ed or anyone that came before me yeah. that's trying to make a living, you know. Um, you know, those folks that own National, they threw the conventions, they had a huge thing going with suppliers, and then the supplier thing broke open, and some tattooers are suppliers, and... Some people get into that because they're thinking about the future. They're like, hey, I can only tattoo for so long. I got a family. What am I going to do after my hands give out? Yeah. I can't really, you know, judge them for wanting to be able to make a living in tattooing. And if you do sell power packs and machines at tattoo conventions, you're a part of the onslaught of making it easier and all that stuff. So, you know, at that point... Do I want to, like, take a stand every time I see something that maybe doesn't sit right with me in my heart? I guess it would really depend if it was, like, a child being molested or if it was something like a woman being beat, you know, or something like, you know, yes, you'd jump in and you'd stop it, you know. But I'm not going to roll up to, like, some dudes that are selling all these, like, power packs to whoever and be like, hey, man, 
I fucking thought you loved tattooing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because what would that do? I would just be a grump, grumpy old tattooer that probably was hanging out by myself and would have to be surrounded by a bunch of young tattooers that like I talk a bunch of shit to and they just go like, yeah, yeah, you know, because they want, that's their way of getting in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about the school and like what happened with that or, uh, I or do, did we talk enough about it I, well I also want to talk about more just from the like the positive side like using your shop as an example of what like the cool. you know, being a tattooer in a positive tattooing community mm-hmm. you know? okay. so I thought the, the thing that looks negative about someone like you know throwing their hand in the air and saying I have a problem it, it, it makes you like pull back for a second and, and make a judgment on the situation like Totally. What's going on? Well, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah that's why you do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, <laughs> the, the aftermath of that was just so fucking cool to see everyone stand up together and put, come together. And and how rad was that? Like, to people who aren't in the tattoo industry or don't spend a lot of time hanging out in shops or uh, where they maybe just get their tattoo knowledge from TV or their friends. Sure. Uh, I don't know that it's obvious that there's like a real community of, of artists Oh, I'm sure it's not. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, how's, how's Oakland been like that? Well, I mean, this is something that I actually, like, want to say and acknowledge, is the fellow who owns Premium Tattoo is Matt Decker. And I didn't know Matt Decker very well. A couple guys that worked for me knew him. I knew who he was, and I always considered him to be, like, part of the Oakland tattoo community. You know, it's not like we got any buddies to be, in, you know, involved yeah. in the Oakland tattoo community. So, when... It was him that he kind of, when I realized that that shop, not him, but let me say it this way, when it was that shop that was being absorbed by the tattoo school, mm-hmm. and that was going to be, you know, pumping out the students or whatever, then it was like, whoa, man, you know, like, hey, I thought you were like one of us. And that day that you're talking about where it ended up, that was going to be a protest during their first class, okay? And Matt, you know, basically saw the light, saw the reaction, and just for the record, like when the news showed up, that school fucking bailed on him, man. Yeah. They threw him out in front of the camera and said, explain what's going on, because uh-huh. the news caught wind of this, and they fucking hightailed it out of town. You know, I got a text from the owner like, oh, you know, you one dude, Matt, Matt caved, you better take care of him, he's a good guy, and it's like, motherfucker, I'll, don't worry about what I'm doing. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you just, you just keep rolling. You know, and I'll go talk to Matt, and we'll work this out together, and I consider him to, to be a friend, and I admire him, and I have a lot of respect for him, because he gave back a chunk of fucking dough yeah. that would be hard to do for anybody, because he realized that, hey, this is going to change my whole dynamic with, like, what I love, and he's a true artist. The guy can paint fucking amazing, and he showed up, you know, like, the protest kind of turned into a celebration, let's say keep it positive and you know it started raining and we were on the phone the night before talking and it was like well fuck man it's good it's a good thing that it's raining because maybe like you know a lot less people will show up and and this and that and then of course you know like it the weather broke and it cleared up but he said on the phone the night before he's like no i'm gonna be there you know i want to be there and you know because i even offered to like just show up and like speak you know let people know that he was like letting the shut the school down and uh he's like no man i want to be there and he wanted to be he was he was, was being, let me say, truly accountable. And, like, hey, we've all fucking made mistakes, you know? He didn't even actually make the mistake. He, like, considered it, went for it, and then was like, nah, this isn't gonna work, and I've done nothing but, you know, sent people his way, and, uh, you know, I would just support him and be down for him till as long as I'm here because of that, you know? So it was really cool. Our friend uh, Ken, who's a badass sign painter, you know, that's a lost art right there. Yeah. You know, he's a badass sign painter and window painter and stuff. And, and he made a, that rad banner that said, if you don't belong, don't be long. And, you know, Matt was there and we showed up. And there was a bunch of people there. You know, I have to say there's probably a good 80 to 100 people there. It was a good chunk, you know, filled up the around the whole front of the shop and a couple storefronts down. And, and um, you know, people got to, like, express their opinion and nobody was fighting. And we all stood arm in arm in arm and took that photo together, you know, and I saw him at first we had spoke on the phone I gave him a big hug and we went into inside and talked alone for a while, you know Because you know, there's a lot of people staring at us and stuff and a couple people taking photos But apparently uh, 
slightly off subject, but also there's this cool guy that I met, and I'm, I think his name is Robert. I'm blanking on it at the moment, but I've, um, I've just tattooed him once, and uh, he's a professor, and he loves tattoos, and he was looking into it, and he was trying to figure out if there had ever been like a protest uh -huh. uh, regarding tattooing, huh. and he couldn't really find anything, you know? Because I was like, ah, no, this has happened before, I'm sure, you know? Yeah. Like, no, I don't think it's that, I don't think it has. So how rad is it in this time of like, divide and conquer and people being split up and like losing their minds over politics and stuff that you know we were able to like totally keep it peaceful and totally keep it like positive and yeah. it all ended on a good note and I think we're all tighter because of it you know that's awesome it was such a dead awesome Oakland moment you know like where <laughs> totally. else was going to happen like where totally. else are all these people going to come together and find common ground well, that's because this is Oakland, and it's not like every other city. And I even, I think in one of those posts, I, re I reminded the dude that owned that school, I'm like, this is the city where the Black Panthers are from. Right. You know, this is the city where the Hells Angels started. Right. You know, this is not just a regular city. This is Oakland, and it's in our blood, and we can make you go home. <laughs> you know? I mean, these days, in a different way. You know, obviously, the way we do it, you know? <laughs> But you know, protesting with the, within your legal right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I guess there's not much else to, to say about the tattoo school. Yeah. Right? That's but it. If we got time, I, I did want to talk about uh, the religious tattoos in general. It, sure. It's definitely a big part of the shop. Um, yeah, I've got time. I was listening to, to old interviews and, and reading stuff, and I'd read like the, what, the Eye of Ra was one of the first things that really caught your eye for tattooing. Yeah. Um, that is true. Has, has religious imagery always been your your big thing? Um, well, I mean, I guess it, I would say it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's what I'm drawn to the most, you know, I mean, I like, there's lots of tattoos that I like that aren't religious, like roses, yeah. for example, but when it came to seeing tattoos, you know, looking through the tattoo time, obviously, and anything else I could get my hands on, and just seeing people around... I, I'm not the kid that like grew up with the uncle from Vietnam that was covered in tattoos or anything like that. You know, I didn't see a lot of tattoos growing up. I did live around a lot of Chicanos and I saw Pachuco crosses and stuff like that. Um, you grew up in Sacramento. Right? Yeah, I grew up in Sacramento. Mostly Sacramento, a little bit in Humboldt, and then I moved to San Francisco in '86. And um, you know, just seeing the black and gray, like big word in old English with like a big Jesus on the chest and the praying hands and stuff like that. It just really, really resonated with me. I'm really drawn to that stuff aside from tattooing. Yeah. So when it came to tattooing, it almost was like at first, like, is it okay for me to get this stuff? You know, because I don't know if I can say that I'm like fully devout Christian. You know, I definitely would consider myself to to be a Christian, but according to like Christian doctrine, it's blasphemous of me to go into like a Buddhist temple and sit down and say a couple prayers. So, you know, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so what I do is I just mix it all up. Yeah. I, for me, you know, I just kind of see it as like, you know, people have different names for God, or you could say like the, the infinite creator, or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, it's like different religions are like different languages. You know, it's all kind of the same shit, just in different packages. Yeah, I was, I was reading something just the other day about uh, how sacred tattooing from, where the hell was it? Somewhere in Monsoon Asia, right, where they would they get like religious uh, symbols to protect them, where like you go to the temple, oh. you donate like a handful of tobacco. Thailand, they do that in. I'm sure they do it in other places. Yeah, Thailand's probably. But Thailand, I think, is maybe what you were thinking of. Yeah, it was like. A, Super a part of their culture, you know. Yeah. Whereas in like Indonesia, it's like mostly Muslim, so tattooing is kind of shunned on. Yeah, and even like in, in in Judaism, there's like a tradition of tattooing like amongst the tribes of Israel. Right? Sure. Yeah, so definitely. Like tattooing and religion it has always been hand in hand, right? Like definitely. It's you a, can say that. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you start getting into later times and the more Puritan side of things, then you know it people kind of shy away from it but you know there are those cases of early Christians tattooing themselves you know when they would be killed for being Christian or you know like you brought up like in the early 
trust is real. And, you know, I'm not sure what they were doing up in Samaria and stuff like that, but I would guess at least the women were getting tattoos. It seemed like mostly women back then were getting more tattoos yeah. because of, um, you know, adornment, I would guess. But then as you get through, like, the South Pacific Islands and more into, like, the warrior culture of, like, the Maori or, um, you know, Samoans or Poly just Polynesian tribes in general, the men and the women get tattooed, you know. And then obviously up in Japan and Asia, it was, like, more of a kind of manliest thing to do. And then they, you know, get the ladies tattooed real quick. <laughs> It's funny, it's funny which cultures are honest about men and women taking pain. Like, in yeah. some culture, the women take, like, all of the all the hard work, all the pain, all the everything. And it, yeah. And in others, it's, it's exactly the opposite. It's true. It's weird how that works. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is your, uh, is it 19-year anniversary? Yeah. Today? It is. Um, this neighborhood has changed a lot in 19 years. Any good stories from back in the day when things were a little crazier? Um, I don't know if there's like really just one that stands out at the at the moment. I mean, I can kind of describe that it used to be a little bit more outlaw and a little bit more loose, where guys could do sideshows on Sunday. Yeah. This intersection right here is huge. There was a couple really cool like gangster clubs around here, like Jeffrey's and Jimmy's where, you know, the streets were just filled on Friday nights and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's just always, like, good times. I remember kind of the first few months that I opened until I got my apartment down the street. I had a partner in SAC, and I'd kind of bounce back and forth to take showers until I, you know, found a spot up here. And I just heard all this noise, crazy noise, music, and just, you know, so I kind of, like, walked down to the bottom of the shop to see what was up. And these guys were like, you know, the doors were open, the car was kind of rolling down the street, and this guy was like dancing on the roof. <laughs> and a squad car pulled around the corner, and kind of lit him up, and I thought, oh man, they're going down. You know, yeah. I mean, I moved here from Sacramento that year. And uh, they, they just like, hey, let's keep it moving, you know what I mean? And, and I know that the police get a bad rap around here, but I just gotta say that honestly, I've been let go way more times than I've ever been. I've never been hemmed up by the OPD. I have by the sheriff, but never the OPD. They always let me go. You know yeah. what I mean? And I don't, maybe I got a little too much white going on. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but they've always been cool to me. And, you know, there's a lot of men of color, Asian, and all types in the OPD. And they uh, they get tattooed. And, yeah. You know, they, they, they just have families and doing their thing. You know what I mean? So, you know, there's always like two sides to every coin. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was, uh, less spots were filled up. There wasn't construction surrounding the place. The rent was way lower and people were, I feel like they were a little happier to be honest, you know, like it was kind of this neat little secret. Oakland was kind of this neat little secret that was happening because, you know, by that time, Brooklyn's being kind of blown out. Manhattan's changing post 9-11 and Silicon Valley is blowing up San Francisco. So there was already kind of a wave of people being pushed out in the city. And I remember in the latter 90s, friends telling me, like, man, I'm trying to go rent an apartment. And there's people showing up with fucking baked cakes and, you know, a year's rent in advance and cash. And, you know, they just couldn't compete with it. So a lot of people kind of moved over here then in the late 90s. And, you know, Scott Silver moved over here and we were working together and uh, still lives here. And, Jeff Rasher lives over here, and Chris Kahn lived here before he moved, even when he was living in the city. So it was kind of like, you know, it's flat. It's a little warmer. You could go to the grocery store and go get some breakfast without running into a shitload of people. and just kind of nice. You know, it had, like, little neighborhoods and stuff. It was real nice. <laughs> and it's still nice. It's just different, yeah. you know. Yeah. My wife and I moved here nine years ago mm -hmm. and even in the nine years that we've been here it's oh. changed so much yeah I mean you've kind of seen it yeah yeah definitely and it's continuing to change like have you been have been down at Fruitvale lately it's it's changed so fast down there yeah those new big fancy looking apartments are oh okay and yeah 
They're popping it's, up around here too. Um, yeah, like I haven't whole, been down through Bell super recently, you know, but I do. I the do whole area by Bart's getting all uh, looking a lot more like Alameda. Yeah, it's well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because they do that intentionally. You know, yeah. they develop right around Bart, so people can run from their from Bart to their apartment. <laughs> Yeah. Like working in a city or wherever they're working, you know what I mean? Because they're still adjusting to living in Oakland. Yeah. So there's elements of Oakland that are still like a little scary for them. So it's like, well, I'll live in West Oakland yeah. as long as I can, like, you know, run to my apartment <laughs> in two minutes. That was basically <laughs> the first place we lived. Here. We, were, we were in Gasco, like right. In fact, our place was on the border between Emeryville and Oakland. Mm -hmm. Oakland side was like a hundred bucks cheaper. Emeryville side was a hundred bucks more expensive. Yeah. And. Uh, there was a lot of people there that ran straight to the BART station. And oh, I'm sure. All they saw at Oakland. Well, what's funny is, like, the crime rate is actually higher in Emeryville. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it's probably because it's per, per capita. Right. You know what I mean? There's not people there, so it kind of weighs it out differently. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've never had any issues, you know. It's like any other city, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I've been to Detroit and New York City and Philadelphia and places like that. You know, I've definitely been way more intimidated by Philly. Yeah. Then Oakland for sure. <laughs> Parts definitely. Yeah. yeah. Anything that you're saying about tattooing these days that you're really excited about? Um, totally, man. I mean, I think uh, it's not super new, but it's relatively new. You know, I really, really dig like this movement of black tattooing that's kind of come back. You know, like I always was a huge fan of you know Lugo Zulueta stuff and Polynesian stuff and you know that stuff that like the Maori or the Borneo tribal like anything that was really graphic like that always had this really strong kind of feel to it and I love what like Zed Lahead and Thomas Thomas and, and John Dix and Thomas Hooper and you know a bunch of other guys are all now doing Dustin Wengren who I work with is doing kind of that like soft black and gray sacred geometry you know it might have some negative prayers in it you know it has an ethnic kind of feel you know there's a there, it depends on what you're looking at but yeah. you know I mean there's like the obvious of like the negative Buddha with the psychedelic auras coming off it or maybe something with a little Sanskrit and yeah. some neat little like Buddhist, Buddhist veneerings or something coming off it so I like stuff that looks like that you know I like that stuff a lot and, um you know, hopefully it stays a little longer than some of the other trends yeah. that are coming along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did all the, uh, the stuff that I right. planned to uh, talk about. Any, anything else you wanted to, to talk about? Or, uh, no. I mean, I, uh, I feel like we talked about some cool stuff. I mean, I would tell anybody that... Uh, can I give a plug? Absolutely. Yeah, shameless plug. I mean, I would tell anybody that wants to get a tattoo to come on down to Temple Tattoo with Tattoo 13 in Oakland, California. And they can obviously Google the phone number and the address. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Well, all right. There you have it. Thank you so much for listening. And man, Freddie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I had a really great time talking about all this stuff. And I'm really glad we got to, uh, to go in depth. You know, I think... You know, I, I worry if someone was was not really paying attention and they only saw a few things about the the tattoo school controversy, they would have missed the point. You know, uh, the the world of tattooing is it's rooted in tradition, and uh, I think that's a really important thing. So I'm I'm glad we got to spend some time and and have a conversation that was more than a, than just a soundbite or a, or a couple of words online. Oakland's a pretty awesome place to live. I know we we talked about it a lot, but uh, it's a hell of a community. Anyways, that's all I got for now. I'll see you guys next time. I got some exciting stuff coming up. Stay tuned. But until then, I'll, uh... Fuck, I feel like I should sign off or something. Do I do that? <laughs>